Okay. <clears throat> we figured out last night that if we keep going at this pace, we may, we most likely will finish uh, Han Chan's text by the end of the semester. And I'm, I'm thinking the end of the semester will be, um, today's what, the middle of April. Maybe the third to fourth, third week of May, we'll probably finish up. So um, I, pr I always say I'm not gonna spend so much time on this, but then something comes up and, but we'll just keep going with it and see if we can get through. Um, last week, Han Chan was talking about as the practice advances, um, uh, as the meditation uh, exercise gets deeper and deeper, um, you have to be aware not so much of whether you're making progress or having an accomplishment. Um, in fact, he encourages everyone to not even have that in your mind, not to have any goals or necessarily any markers or any ambitions or expectations, even worse, fantasies about meditation, about enlightenment, about altered states of consciousness, all this. He, basically, what he's describing is this is a very normal and ordinary process of reclaiming your, in your own capacity to do this, that you have this ability, that you have this fundamental nature um, as maybe twisted and covered over or distorted as it might be in its present state. It is the Buddha nature. It is uh, the potential for full awakening. Don't doubt that. And the other thing is, if you've studied and put this together, then don't doubt your methodology. Don't melt, doubt your practice. Stay with those two. You've got a map, you've got a laboratory guide, and you've got trust in your own nature. And if you keep on this, you will succeed. Um, just don't get uh, distracted or uh, create false doubts. Now, that being said, doubts will arise, but these are doubts that he's going to address and say these are the doubts that are coming up that are ones that are the result of this practice of probing. So you, you have faith in yourself, I'm using faith or trusting yourself, and you have confidence in the method, a method that's been passed along from generation to generation. Um, it's systematic, it's thorough, uh, it's reliable, but the doubts will still come up, and doubts will come up, and this is what he's talking about tonight. Last week he said, don't generate doubts on your own, just keep moving ahead in your practice. Um, and he says, don't second guess yourself, uh, and so on and so forth. When these states arise, simply don't move, don't be moved by them and just persevere, and all your anxiety and worries will just evaporate because they don't have any ground to them at all. Um, and then he says this kind of remarkable thing, when you reach the place where you feel as if you can't go on, either you can't go on because you have this feeling of doubt in yourself, or you can't go on because you imagine that you're meeting all this resistance and obstacles. Neither of these are, are valid. And he says, when you feel you can't go on, just go on. And what happens there is these things evaporate by themselves because they didn't have anything to them in the first place. Right here he says you'll experience something marvelous. Now we go on to tonight's passage. Um, so he says, next, I'll read the whole thing through and then we'll go back over it. Next, do not give in to fear. And we wrestled with this quite a bit last night. We'll come to back to why. As a result of your intense cultivation, you may find that your confused or false thinking suddenly ceases. You might feel unmoored and empty, adrift in space. Where you once felt or experienced solid ground, there will only seem to be or only be an abyss. Terror, actually, fright may overcome you. If you don't see through this, you won't have the courage to move forward. Or you may become nihilistic, thinking nothing matters and feel like you're above it all. Two translations of this last line, by the way, the parentheses is the second translation, or you may feel you've achieved emptiness and mistake it for nirvana. If you regard this emptiness as real, you will give rise to a major wrong view of denying cause and effect. This is most dangerous. Okay, so here's um, a state that he's describing. Let's go into it a little bit and talk about it. 
Um, so he says, uh, before it was the doubts. So he said, you know, he's going through a list here. Don't seek for anything. Don't hanker after marvelous states of mind or anything. Just let your mind be calm uh, and just do it and don't look for anything to happen. Because if you fish for things to happen, this is where you go wrong. And then he says, don't generate doubts. And don't lose your energy and don't get worried. And now he goes into two things here. One is fear and the other one is hubris. Very interesting. Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a point tonight. I think they're different sides of the same coin. But let's, let's look at what he's saying. So don't give in to fear. Literally, um, you could translate this as don't generate fear. Um, instead of giving into him, we went back and forth on the slide. Because the text, you know, the, the shung, is indicating it's something that you do. In other words, if you give in to fear, there's sort of an implication there's something out there to be afraid of, and then you give in to it. And I think more what he's saying here is don't, there's nothing out there to be afraid of. What is happening is a fear arises within you, it's self generated. And how you respond to it makes it real or not real. If you ignore it, it disappears by itself because it's not a real fear out there. Okay, look at it. You're sitting in a meditation hall on a cushion. What is there to be afraid of? Well, when I sit at home, it's really funny. I had nothing to be afraid of. And then my little niece came over and she, was, she always looks to look at my closets and everything like that. So she says, what do you do there? I said, I sit. You sit there. Why do you? Well, I sit in meditation there. And she says, show me how. So I sat in meditation. She says, aren't you afraid? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She says, look. And of course, I'd hung this huge planter from my ceiling above my meditation spot. And she's thinking, if there's an earthquake, Unky, that'll fall. <laughs> so I thought, before there was nothing to be afraid of. Now I'm afraid. <laughs> Sitting on my meditation. But you know, that aside, if you look at it, there you are sitting. You really apply effort. And the thoughts begin to settle, and the emotional states begin to calm, and there's not so many ups and downs. You may and find yourself getting to a place where that mad monkey mind starts to get quiet. It almost comes to a rest. The waters are still. And when this happens, for, for some people, this is a first. It's almost an overwhelming feeling of joy, of, uh, of the unexpected, uh, almost tears can come at this time because for the first time in your life everything's just been okay. <laughs> everything's just okay and there's no problem. And this feeling is can be wondrous but he says you might, and this is the line here, you might on the other hand feel unmoored, empty, and adrift in space. Now why does he say that? And again, I, I want to, the language here is, it could, it might. This is not definite. This is not something that everyone is going to experience in their meditation process. This is, if this does happen. He's going for the big ones, okay? Uh, what I would call the sort of generic states that almost all people are prone to, not the specifics. Your specific doubts and uh, dreams and illusions will be yours. But he's pointing to the big pattern here, the meta-narrative, uh, which you know 90-some percent of people will fall into, some sort of fear and some sort of pride or hubris. And he's just saying, so it might happen. But why would you feel unmoored, empty, and adrift when this happens, when this wondrous, busy, mad mind comes to a stop for a few minutes? Okay, so her answer was, you're so used to distractions, and therefore... When, when there's a void, when you don't have them, it's actually a good thing, but you're not used to it because you're habituated. Okay, so a couple things. You're not accustomed to this, and so it's unfamiliar ground. It's terra incognita that you're on now. And what was your thing? Right, and you're saying with such effect is they're gone and now what? It's, you can go free at last or you can go, where? Where am I going to grab? What can I hold on to here? Um, actually, there's nothing going on. There's, 
Wow, there's nothing going on? Whoa. And all of a sudden, this whole thing can. So this is one way to look at what's going on here. Now, the opposite of this you want to investigate. So the mad mind being busy is for what reason then? And why do we become used to it, and why do we become habituated so that when it stops, we actually freak out? I want to come back to this, because I think what he's talking about here is something pretty deep psychologically of what's going on and how, how we work as human beings. Um, if, if we're unaccustomed to it, and that's what happens, then if we look at the theory here that this, this consciousness, this nature, this mind, has everything whole and complete. It needs nothing. It's lacking nothing. It is the awakened potential whole. There it is. Then its present state is a state that has been twisted, a little bit deformed. Uh, we can use language like covered over. They use clouds. It's be clouded. Or it's, uh, I use another analogy, it's a little frozen and stiff and tied in knots. One substance, but it's not functioning with its pure, you know, vibe of clarity. And so that's our normal state, the afflicted, the not clear, the consciousness twisted, a little bit distorted, uh, a little bit frozen, a little bit covered over. So what's happening here, and that happens for a reason, we built that up. <laughs> and we built it up according to either conscious or unconscious choices we made to deal with certain real, what we call certain realities. And we've created then this structure, this house, the Buddha says. I built this house. I built this house to keep out this and this and this, to bring in this and this and this, to feature this and this and this. Even the pictures on my wall are framed to remind me of who's important, myself. <laughs> <laughs> so we built a house and we turned our consciousness, this this what they call a consciousness that is vast and is unattached as empty space, and we have collapsed it down to this little cottage of consciousness that's me and mine. And that's where we exist most of our time. This is the dream that the Buddha says we're in. This is the sleep we're in. So when you meditate, and if you do it properly, what you're doing is you are peeling away those layers. You're taking off the coverings bit by bit. Um, the Avatamka says you're opening and expanding your consciousness so that it is unimpeded, unattached, unbound, and totally liberated. But in doing that, all of these things that were constructed to preserve or protect something that was mere mine now have to come under investigation. The hammer is starting to pull at the nails that's holding it together. The wind of your meditation is starting to blow the shingles off the top, right? You're shaking things up. And so, when finally that false thinking stops, which is the motor that's driving and holding this whole show together, and the image I like is the Wizard of Oz. So if you, those of you who've seen the Wizard of Oz, you know, my sister never saw it. Well, she saw some of it. We went to the Wizard of Oz, we were so excited. When it got to that plate where those meanies were flying down, she got so freaked out she ran out of the theater and didn't see the end of the movie. So she never, did Dorothy ever go home? I said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> to this day, she's 60 some. She still hasn't gone back to it. Nonetheless, the Wizard of Oz, if you remember, there's this huff and puff and bluster about who the wizard is. And finally, when Dorothy and the Tin Man go behind the scene, it's just this pathetic little professor doing his widgets and diggle, you know, making all this steam and spuff and smoke and everything. And you go, oh. So the same thing happens when you're cultivating what you take to be this awesome mind in its states, my fears, my doubts, my anxieties, and so forth, you start to meditate, and when it stops, you see it's just a pathetic little kid <laughs> working the dials. And all of a sudden, it goes, huh? Caught. Everything stops. There can be a liberation, but then you start to realize, I've just deconstructed my little house. And that sense of now I'm expanding into this open consciousness can be a little unmooring, a little feeling of emptiness. I would say it's even more fundamental. I think the heart of this is the first turning where we set up a barrier against this reality has to do with the knowledge of our own mortality. And so the house or this layer that gets pushed back at this point is something that we put up to sort of protect ourselves or deny or repress awareness of our own mortality. 
I mean, this is really, this is deep. And there's a lot of people um, who feel, both psychologists and philosophers, and I think you could interpret the Buddha this way, that a great deal of human activity, of karma, intentional activity, is driven not because of ambition or lust or desire, but driven by anxiety, and the anxiety is driven by this not wanting to face our own mortality. And so we cover, we get busy, we fill up the space. And when you meditate, anything you constructed that stands in the way of your liberation has to be deconstructed. You can't go around it, you know, you can't bury it and hope it goes away. You can't hide it and reduce it down to a little chip and think nobody will notice I'm carried because that chip will just expand in your mind. And so you have to unpack, you have to break through that. That fear that's coming up is that big fear. In other words, the fear of I am not this, this too will pass. And how you dealt with that is to create this life, this constructed business and so forth. When that mind stops, so does that. And that's what you're facing. So to get past, to get freedom, you have to be not hanging on and afraid of anything. And the big one is this one. The last one is, and the first one perhaps, is the fear and the awareness that I am mortal, I will pass, I will die, then what? And because we have no means we feel to cope with that, we then quickly set up a lot of things. Um, one of the interesting things coming out on anxiety, depression these days is one, it used to be thought that anxiety, depression was just a pulling away from and disengagement of life and reality. And you could tell that somebody was depressed, anxiously depressed, um, because they didn't come out of the room, they didn't eat regularly, they didn't hang out with friends, and they lost uh, ambition to finish projects and so forth. Uh, what caught people by surprise, and this was coming up really on college campuses, they started to notice a number of suicides of young people, and they were perplexed because they showed none of the signs of anxiety, depression that they were, you were taught to look for, we as teachers to be taught to look for. Um, they were coming from the most ambitious, the most successful, the most driven students, the double and triple majors who belonged to every club and had great friends and were Facebooking and texting all the time. And they realized what was going on, that this was a mask covering. So there was two ways to respond to the anxiety depression. One was to just be overwhelmed by it and sink into a, an emptiness. And the other was to get so busy that there wasn't a space for that to come up. Um, but it would still come up. And when it came up, there was no more busyness you could do, and then it, it triggered a switch. So I, I think you know what's being talked about here is this fear that comes up is a fear that you have created in not dealing with this. And in dealing with this, the fear will then evaporate. And what he's saying is the way you deal with it is not necessarily rationally, because it doesn't have a, quote, rational. That's what got you into the, the constructed thing in the first place. You hang on to the method, and it dissolves and goes through by itself. This is where you have to keep applying effort at this point with your pro meditation. So terror may overcome you. If you don't see through this, you won't have the courage to move forward. You have to break through this point. At the same point, you're not seeing through it and saying, oh, I figured out the riddle to my mortality, is that you don't allow yourself to be frozen by the fear. The fear, when it initially came, now when it comes, it's different for everybody. It might come when you're a child, it might come with somebody, your first uh, experience with sickness or someone close to you dies, and the, the, the fear is there, it, it's in the air. It, it, it comes to different people at different times, and at that moment, what most people end up doing because they don't have the wherewithal to to handle it, they then, a fear arises, and the fear becomes so powerful that they didn't deny and repress and move it to other places and hope that it can, they can keep it at bay. And so what the Buddha is saying, a lot of our desires, a lot of our hedonism is driven by trying to keep that at bay, trying to keep so busy, so, so drunk in a sense, so stimulated that this doesn't come back because we realize it's the big boogeyman. Okay, and we, we don't feel like we can take it on. So we do this pushing away. Um, so what he's saying here, if you do not yield to the fear, this method will deliver you through. If you yield to the fear, 
you'll get stuck and you won't be able to move on. So don't, at this point, get into an intellectual meditation about mortality, per se. Simply hold to the method that's gotten you to the point of bringing back to that, and then just keep with the method, and the method will push you through. And then on the other side, you'll see, oh, okay. So it's a kind of catch-22 here. Or you may become, now here's the other side of this. And actually, this probably should be two paragraphs. Or you may become nihilistic, thinking nothing matters. Okay, so here's the first thing. Facing this, you could become afraid and cling and grasp and uh, almost become paralyzed by this. Or you can go to the other extreme and say, nothing matters. There's nothing whatsoever. You die, the lights go out. Uh, life doesn't have any cause and effect to it. It's just capricious. It's random. There's no meaning. There was no purpose. And what I'm saying earlier, I think these are two sides of the same coin. They're both two ways of dealing with denying this. One, you deny it, but you're paralyzed by fear, and you cover and, and you know create all kinds of stuff to fill the space. And the other, you deny it uh, by saying there's anything going on whatsoever. And it seems as if you're free then, but you're not. You're still going to die. And you still know you're going to die. But there's a tension here. The hubris thing comes in to say, and he says it goes to the extreme. You may feel, you may interpret this emptiness that you're feeling and mistake it for the highest goal. So although it doesn't say nirvana, you, those of you who are reading the Chinese won't say, say it says nirvana, uh, it is referring to the supreme miao, the wonderful, which is another metaphor that's used throughout for nirvana. So either way, you think I've attained the highest state and I am above it all and nothing can touch me. So before the, the anxiety was everything can touch me. People that get this is like Howard Hughes. Remember, people know who Howard Hughes is? The, the billionaire who was into the airplane industry. But as his life going on, this anxiety of death became so overwhelming that he sealed himself into this room and all his food had to be, you know, tested two or three times before it came in. Visitors couldn't come in unless they sterilized themselves. And went through. So, so he, he kind of hermetically sealed himself against the forces of nature, so that thinking that he could stave off mortality this way. And you can see there's a lot in our culture that is geared for helping you with this. <laughs> Who's to say you're not supported here? So your little fantasies can be inflated immensely by advertising, by consumption, by all the commodities and things out there. Um, and even in the way that you go about dying, it's all set up to convince you that you're not really dying. You're going into this really cool coffin, you know, and you can have music pumped in there, or you can be frozen and brought back at some time. Um, and even as soon as somebody dies, we quickly say, ah, they're in a better place now. You know, so this whole thing is set up to keep you structured in a way that this fear is seemingly held at bay. Except when you yourself are going through it, all this stuff starts to look real thin. <laughs> okay. So, he said, if you regard this emptiness as real, this state, in other words, either you feel adrift and unmoored and you're uncertain, or you feel this sort of sense of, um, I am emptiness, emptiness is mean, there's nothing whatsoever, I reached the highest point. He said, you could fall into a major wrong view of denying cause and effect, and this is most dangerous. And this goes into the idea that then you're amoral and you feel as if nothing that you do has any consequences. And when you're at this point, you're still subject to the law of effect, but you're denying it. And so you're not in a position to actually control it. Um, someone once asked if Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and sages were um, beyond cause and effect. In other words, transcended cause and effect. And the answer that was given is that they're not uh, beyond cause and effect, they're just not confused by it. And so they don't make, it's not that it doesn't affect them, but it means they are not um, confused about it. That's a very interesting, so the cause and effect still, see cause and effect would have to work if you're gonna become a Buddha because if there's no cause and effect then nothing you do would have any results. <laughs> right? So, and if you're saying that 
living beings and Buddha are one substance, of it, so the cause and effect must be operative throughout. Hence, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can make vows to return into different realms to teach and transform. You see this, well, that would only happen if there's some cause and effect between intentionality and results. So um, it's not that they're free of cause and effect or uh, they have f freedom of cause and effect, they have mastery over it. It's a very different kind of concept. And so it seems as if they're free of it, and it's only because they've mastered it, it's, it's almost markless how, how good they are at not making intentional karma. Okay? And so he's saying this is most dangerous because at this point you're not. It's um, like getting stoned. This has happened a few times to people back in some time. Um, when I was working in an emergency room back in the 60s, uh, someone came in who was really mangled. Uh, and they were, it was a university student, uh, a scientist, by the way, <coughs> who had um, decided to do an experiment with physics uh, on LSD. And having taken the LSD, entered the state of feeling this just huge megalomania grandiosity, and then said, Newton was wrong, <laughs> right? And gravity is only for certain beings, but not. And so jumped off this building to prove his point. And although all the way down in his mind, he was no longer subject to cause and effect gravity, when he went poof, and he realized he was. So fortunately, he didn't die, but um, a case in point is if you're going to take cause and effect to be a constant, then it's not the case that it ever stops operating. You just get better at mastering it or not, but it's still operative, um, like gravity. Okay. So. Say that again a little louder. Far, yeah. Right. This, this, and this goes into terms like nirvana, because nirvana then uh, has been interpreted as you are, uh, you have ended birth and death, and then that gets interpreted as you've ended existence, which is extinction, which is a desirable goal. And how how does this? Because how does that different than the nihilistic one of not wanting to feel or know anything? So what I think what's being talked about here, just from this passage tonight, if you want to say at one level. Ending birth and death is getting past the fear. When you're past the fear, you've gone a long way to ending whatever that experience is. In other words, seeing it as terminal, seeing it as the end and nothing more, and the fear that keeps you from going any further with that is in fact to be caught in death. And getting past that, what the text is encouraging you to do here, and not in just an intellectual way, but a direct, visceral way of knowing for yourself that this indeed is not things as they really are. That is an ending of birth and death, but it doesn't mean existence ceases. It just ceases to be a problem. <laughs> and it's different. <laughs> it's different. Okay? Yes? I just... <clears throat> Time itself as a conceptual structure uh, 
then that is actually transcendent. It's just that there's a superficial way of doing that where you you declare that the relative in the relative there's no cause and effect, and then you go off and do immoral things. Whereas in the relative there's always cause and effect. If you have time, then you have cause and effect. That's how time looks from that perspective. But when you transcend the perspective of time, then you transcend cause and effect. But at that point, there's, there can't be a selfish motive, so there's no possibility for morality. So I think um, both sides have to be seen. My take of this is that, um, that he's saying don't be superficial in, in your understanding of there's no cause and effect. So even in the uh, Konglan that you mentioned, um, I'm not sure of the exact translation, but Bajang, uh, when he responds to whether awakened beings are free of cause and effect, says awakened beings don't ignore cause and effect. They don't ignore the experience that other people are causing cause and effect, because they themselves might not believe it. say that there is cause and effect and that's reality, we have a problem. So your example with the physicist, um, it's true that Newton was wrong, actually. It's just, it's a mistake to then jump off a building, because in that relativistic experience, it's going to seem exactly like Newton was right, and we have to, in the relative realm, act as if it's right. We talk about past and future, we talk about me, we can't be afraid to say I, but ultimately we also can understand that there isn't right. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting state you bring up, but um, how do you find comfort within the state itself? Like, mm. like the state you're talking about up here. Which state? Like, like the nihilistic, like emptiness, like nothing matters. Like Why would somebody find comfort? Like, how do you find comfort in such a state? Like, I'm just curious. I mean, how somebody, when the, what the text is describing, how would they feel comfortable in that state? Yeah, like how, is there a way to feel comfortable? Well, I think what he's suggesting here, there is a sense of comfort that the person feels who's in the state, and it's a sense that I'm impervious to things, and therefore I have transcended because nothing can touch me now. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, what the text is describing is sort of a, a false sense of thinking, I have arrived at the state where I am completely now free, and I've reached the highest state, and, uh, and calling this a kind of emptiness. But what the text is, is saying is that this too is a, like the fear, it's a reaction to it. It's not penetrating it. It's getting, it's getting stopped by the, by the sensation there. So in a sense, probably what they're saying, it, it'll last for a while, but it can't last forever because it's not, it's not real. And so the emptiness will start to feel as if there's something wrong here. You'll start to feel... Uh, that it's not really working. It's and one of the measures brittle. of this, yeah. huh? It's brittle, it sounds like. It's well, it's brittle, brittle, and one of the measures of this is that Clatia still arises. So as long as the afflictions still arise, then the emptiness, and that's where you see some of the exchanges when somebody uh, says, oh, I've reached emptiness, and the teacher will give some test, um, pushing one of the buttons, and if there's a response, then, the, of course, if there's true emptiness, then how can there still be Clatia? So clasia becomes, the absence of clasia is actually one of the markers for, that you can reliably sort of look at to say whether or not some ha something's happening here. If my greed, my anger, my delusion, my jealousy, and so forth, if these are diminishing, then it's some measure of really getting something empty, as opposed to, you know, just having this sensation that you're holding on to. Um, and this is not too much different than... Um, the sense of wanting to be powerful, to be all-powerful. So the quest for power often comes as a manifestation of this emptiness, which is another way uh, Buddha talked about the using meditation as a kind of entering oblivion, so that it's actually a form of non-existence, meaning the desire not to have anything affect and, and touch and move and, and, and penetrate. And this is a false state because it's a numbing down of consciousness rather than really emptying it. It seems to me that the, the fundamental flaw of it also is that it, it totally lacks any compassion for others. And, and so if you're convinced that 
nothing matters, then you're also telling yourself that there aren't other people who are experiencing legitimate emotions, feelings, you know, thoughts, perspectives. Um, you're just denying that 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 is real, and it it, it seems to violate kind of a fundamental aspect of. That's why I, I, I was saying I think they're both part of the same coin. Fear insulates you and encapsulates you and paralyzes you. And so does hubris in the same way that you're mentioning. Both of them protect the self yeah. mm -hmm. from facing its own you know, s setup. And so they both work in similar ways, although they have different faces. Um, I think they're masking the same psychological or spiritual uh, truth here. And it's not... It's not that these are criticized or condemned, it's just saying these are not skillful, they're not productive to liberation. So if you get here, it's not like you're to be blamed or censured. It's just to be saying, and in fact, it wouldn't even come up, but these weren't natural inclinations we would have to facing these kinds of things. Um, if you think about when you face things that are anxiety producing, sometimes we get overwhelmed by them, we try to pull away and not, not engage them and we become terrified. And sometimes we get a kind of bluster going and we try to overpower them and control them and commandeer them. Um, but both of them are driven um, by this uh, anxiety, this, this sense of self being threatened. So um, those of you who are teachers realize that sometimes often what you see in children is the opposite of what manifests. So sometimes, you know, bluster is covering insecurity and, and so on and so forth. And so you, if you read it in reverse, and these are the defense mechanisms that we put up, I mean, we're using psychological terms, but the Buddha is saying the whole construction of self and what belongs to self is a building up of this house, of a me and a mind that we want to make sure, try to keep on, when in fact we know we can't. And so the, the, this is just, that's where the stress of the dukkha comes from. We're trying to make something work that is a false project to begin with. Um, so this is... It's really subtle what's going on because both it's a meditation state, but also it's a state that's just universal. It's not just limited to meditation. Just a quick comment. With regard to the question about the attraction of nihilism, I think about like a heavy metal or a grunge rock concert. There's just something attractive about smashing the guitar, putting the volume way up, obliterating all sensation, and feeling like I don't care. But then you wake up the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a famous line from some... Um, Elizabethan thing. It was um, uh, they were in the in the process of celebrating the hedonistic abandon, and the the the, the knight or ever raised his cup and says, "Let us drink, gentlemen, until we roll under the tables and vomit on oblivion." <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's the same sort of thing, uh, and so either way, though, it's still there when you come out of oblivion. Oblivion's hard to hang on to. Um, Anyway, on that, I was just going to share one section tonight that I like. Uh, this is from Zhuangzi, and it's, it's a kind of thing where Zhuangzi has a slight awakening um, regarding uh, death and dying, but this is regarding his wife. So I thought I'd just share tonight. Unless I was thinking if things got so heavy here, we were talking about um, we live most of our lives uh, trying to escape the <laughs> awareness of our mortality. Uh, then maybe when we look at Zhuangzi, who... Uh, so this is a famous passage, and we can read it. Um, so Zhuangzi's wife died, and when Huizhi went to convey his condolences, he found Zhuangzi sitting with his legs sprawled out, pounding on a tub and singing. Now, pounding a tub means he probably just took a pot and had it upside down, and he was hammering away on it. And uh, Huizhi says, you lived with her. She brought up your children and grew old with you. Uh, it should be enough simply not to weep at her death, but pounding on a tub and singing, this is going too far, isn't it? Okay. Now you have to remember they're coming out of a tradition where the rites of mourning and so forth are pretty prescribed. And uh, to be pounding on, a, you know, turning up the music and singing out loud during karaoke is a little... Uh, and Zhuangzi says, you're wrong. When she first died, do you think I did not grieve like anyone else? But soon, pondering, contemplating on what had happened, see, this is the thing. His first reaction was to have to grieve. But then he, he contemplates and he says, I'm pondering, I told myself that in death, no strange new fate befalls us. When I look back to her beginning and the time before she was born, 
not only the time before she was born, but the time before she had a body. And not only the time before she had a body, but the time before she had a spirit. In the midst of the jumble and wonder and mystery, a change took place, and she had a spirit, another change, she had a body, another change, she was born. Now there's been another change, and she's dead. For not nature only, but man's being has its seasons. It's just like the progression of the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Now she's going to lie down peacefully in a vast room. If I were to follow after her, bawling and sobbing, it would show that I don't understand anything about the nature of things, so I stopped. So I wanted to share this. Um, I've had people say that this has gotten them through times when they've lost someone really close to them, that they do this contemplation. But I, the reason I bring it up tonight is to say that there's many different ways of meeting that fear. Uh, Zhuangzi's way is one way of taking it on, is to see it as, why, why would I be so afraid of what is natural? If the seasons come and go, and we come and go, and there's no escaping that, um, then I should find a way to come to terms with that that isn't crazy and, and resisting and demanding I have my way against all these things. So you're, you're kind of using it as a contemplation to uh, frame it in a, in a larger perspective, which takes away the sort of narcissistic um, kind of like, why is this happening to me and resistance? Um, so this is one way. Uh, Han Chan will have other ways and take different texts approach it different ways, but this is a, a kind of natural-based way to see it as part of the, the curvature of life and death as being in a continuous cycle. So, just a contemplation. Huh? Do you know the year this was written? The year that was just written? Whenever? Uh, well, Zhuangzi is um, after the Tao Te Ching, so I'm thinking Zhuangzi is probably, what, 4th, uh, 3rd, 4th century B.C.? Around then? Early. Yeah, early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those of you who haven't read Zhuangzi should. It's, Zhuangzi is really, especially the inner chapters, is, is really um, both a lot of fun and edifying both. He's got a very playful nature, so he pulls at things. He's the one that has the story of the frog at the well, bottom look at the well looking up, and uh, trying to give a, a mouse a ride and a stagecoach and thinking that would be fun. He said, it's fun for people, but for mice, it's terrifying. <laughs> and then his, his line is, so nurture people as they're meant to be nurtured and other things as they're meant to be nurtured. So it's like, it's a kind of a statement about upaya, but also um, relativities, differences of scale and so forth. Um, anyhow, I guess that's it for tonight. I was gonna do a little Shakespeare, but we're out of time, so maybe next week. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll go on. The next passage coming up uh, for Hanshan is really a powerful line about where the trust should be placed. It has to do with this question of sin of faith. So that'll be next week. Any announcement to be made? <clears throat> So the 27th, yes. which is a Sunday. Yes. Okay. Hung Zhuang is a Buddhist nun, and I'm just reading her master's right now. <laughs> I'm behind. Uh, she wrote a master's on meditation. Uh, very interesting. She's uh, been hanging out in Taiwan for quite a while. It's really wonderful. i just tell you a quick story. The last time I, w I was in Taiwan, we were in Taipei, and I went to s see her, and I hadn't seen her for a long time. So we got together at our hotel, and um, so it was three nuns and myself sitting in the lobby of this hotel, and then Hung Zhuang brought this whole tea service thing with her. And uh, she said, in the last three or four years, I've had a lot of anxiety, but I've been using the tea ceremony as a meditation device to calm and center me. And she said, so I want to, said, well, let's go. And so the guy who's behind the desk sees this, and he says, oh, I can help. And he brings out a whole hot pitcher of water, plugs it in, 
And then she spreads this whole thing out on the table, does the cups, does the tea, pours it, you know, does the whole thing. And I grab mine, and I'm writing, oh, no. She said, no. <laughs> First, you have to hold it up and get the fragrance, let the fragrance. And she said, just like in Taiji, you let it go deep down into your toes and your feet. And, <coughs> Just smell that fragrance, and then the first sip, you just keep in your mouth a little bit, like, and so we did it. It was like three hours we were there, <laughs> just doing this tea thing. People came, people went, the, the tourists came in, you know, rah, 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 and they're gone again, and we're just pouring tea. Uh, and I said, you know, you can come to the campus here, and we'll just make this a course. <laughs> Learning how to be quiet uh, is, uh, be a good course, and tea's a nice way to do it. So. You might invite her to do a little tea thing on this, too. <laughs> oh, the announcement is that uh, Buddhist Nang Hung Zhuang is going to give a lecture uh, at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery at 3.30 on Sunday the 27th on crossover between Mahayana and Theravada text, and maybe some tea. I don't know. <laughs> OK, let's do the transparent. Ding, li, san, bao, 